Paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. said that if Tom Thompson hadn't have happened, the nation would have had to have invented him. His art really transcends the moment and becomes emblematic. He died in 1917, tragically and mysteriously. In his death, ironically, he's become this living phenomenon. Well, the McMichael Canadian Art Collection really builds upon this mythology. This gallery is unique. I mean, we are a log cabin in the middle of suburbia. Although aesthetically a log and stone building is lovely, it becomes very difficult to maintain. It's kind of a rare building, and uh, we don't like to say challenges, but every time you solve one problem, sometimes you open up other problems. This is a painting of Tom Thompson's tent. He bought it in 1915. At the time, Tom Thompson was a Canadian artistic superstar. He single-handedly inspired a new style of Canadian art depicting the great outdoors. At first glance, this sketch looks like one of Thompson's more simple works. But it provides a window into the life of a man who spent weeks at a time in the wilderness. It's also a link to his mysterious death. The first time he used this tent was near the lake that would later take his life. It was a tragedy that cemented his legacy as the father of Canadian art forever. When you look at the paintings, you realize that he had a great intuitive sense, he had a great color sense, and he really captured not just what the North looked like, but the experience of the North. So that when you look at his paintings, you really can feel the North. And when you go to the North, you, you're really in a Tom Thompson landscape. And that's the enduring magic and the power of Tom Thompson is that his art really transcends the moment and becomes emblematic. It changes the way you perceive the landscape. And I think that's what the highest art does, and he's it. Tom Thompson's love of the outdoors inspired his work and might have also claimed his life. But the same elements that made him love the outdoors, the light, the fresh air, might also be ruining his work. That's unless staff here at the McMichael Canadian Art Collection worked tirelessly to save it. But who was Tom Thompson? He was born in 1877 in Claremont, Ontario. Shortly afterwards, he and his family moved to Leaf, Ontario, growing up on the shores of Georgian Bay. In fact, that's where his love of Canadian wilderness took root. He was probably a Presbyterian, and they were rugged individualists. And he was a rugged individualist who had some presence in Toronto. He knew that the big towns, but he never lost touch with his his Canadian roots in uh, middle Ontario, and the, the, the strong attraction, the pull of Algonquin Park that really wasn't too far away from Leith to begin with, so the wilderness was really at his doorstep. And being a rugged individualist, you would need to know how to use an ax, you need to know how to chop wood, you would need to know how to fish, you'd need to know how to handle a canoe, you'd need to know how to find your way through the wilderness, and he was that, so he represented that. Tom Thompson came along at just the right time to make the impact he did. He was at the height of his artistic career during the dark days of World War I. So Canada at that time is trying to assert a national presence. And we saw that the victory at Vimy Ridge, which occurred just prior to Thompson's death, that that was a key moment in nation building. And they were looking for a cultural uh, icon too. And Thompson 
the quintessential woodsman, the quintessential artist, the great painter became that. So a lot of things came together, not in a deliberate way, but there was a kind of synchronicity, a, a, a perfect storm of forces um, in Western Europe, in the Canada's North, in Leith in Toronto, and Thompson, Thompson was that person. That synchronicity began its magic in 1908 when Tom Thompson got a job working as a commercial artist at the Toronto design firm Grip Limited. There, he met many of the other men who would go on to form the Group of Seven, a group that stood to define Canadian art. The other men were Franklin Carmichael, Frank Johnson, Arthur Lismer, J.E.H. MacDonald, and Frederick Varley. Later, these men would be joined by Lauren Harris and A.Y. Jackson. Realizing they all shared common passions for art and the natural wilderness, they soon started talking about ways they could create a distinctive style of Canadian art. Thompson and his newfound artist friends started taking weekend sketching trips up to areas like Georgian Bay and Algonquin Park, where Thompson, the rugged outdoorsman, was already a guide. In fact, as Arthur Lismer, one of the members of the group, said, he was very much the, um, the voyager. He was the adventurer for the group. And he introduced them to Algonquin Park, which, of course, was the subject of so many of his sketches and works that we have here in the collection. I think all the members of the Group of Seven, that group of artists who were painting and going into Canada's north as kind of the north was opening up, recognized in Tom Thompson that he was the real deal. He was a great artist. He was a natural. Tom Thompson was self-taught. He was not um, like Lauren Harris and J.H. MacDonald, um, educated abroad, or A.Y. Jackson, and knew a lot. And in fact, A.Y. Jackson introduced him to Impressionism and Art Nouveau um, because he was essentially unschooled. And I think that you see in a canvas like this a lot of the influence that an artist like A.Y. Jackson would have had on Tom Thompson. Bing Inlet is one of Thompson's most iconic works. He painted it in the winter of 1914 to 1915. By then, he'd already mastered Impressionism with his use of color and brush strokes. And you see these wonderfully strong compositions, strong design, these heavily impasto brush strokes. These are very much the elements that you see in Tom Thompson's work that you see also show up in the Group of Seven's work. Because of course, unfortunately, he died in 1917, tragically and mysteriously, prior, prior to the formation of the group. He died at the age of 39 and was found drowned in Canoe Lake, one of his favorite um, areas for painting. In fact, these four small paintings are among his last works. Spring, 1917. Tom Thompson went on a trip to the very lake in Algonquin Park that would soon claim his life. His mission? To create one sketch for every day he spent at Canoe Lake. He was trying to survive as an artist. and He was, I think, uh, trying to live out a full life in Algonquin Park in the north. He was a guide, he was a skilled woodsman, but he also was painting. He was trying to capture the seasons, the changing of the seasons. Tom was very much, uh, you know, disciplining himself uh, by making one painting a day, day or night, in the outside or the inside, or trying to remember what he saw. While Tom Thompson was capturing the barrenness and magic of springtime in Canoe Lake, men on the other side of the Atlantic were dying. Remember, too, that these paintings are being made with the backdrop of the darkest days of World War I. The Battle of the Somme has occurred. Vimy has occurred. The great push on the western front of Passchendaele and Ypres is, is just about to start, and it looked hopeless. The Allied forces were trying to break the rather firm, seemingly unbreakable German line, defensive line, and were not doing well in thousands and thousands and thousands of soldiers on both sides, but particularly on the Allied side, on the Canadian side, were being killed and these were his peers. And so the fact that he is reflecting directly his experience as a human being at this time, they can't help but be, I think, melancholy. It was a melancholy age. Spring turned into summer, and Tom Thompson went to Canoe Lake one last time. In early July, 
of 1917 that a number of things may have happened, may not have happened. But what we do know is that Tom Thompson died. He drowned and his, his canoe was discovered floating in the, in the lake and his body was recovered several days later on July the 16th. In the days before his body was discovered, news of his disappearance started getting out. Was it an accident or foul play? All anyone knew at the time was that he was last seen on Sunday, July 8th, and that his canoe was found adrift, upside down. Then his body was found. He had a four-inch bruise on his temple. His legs were tangled in fishing line. The man, Tom Thompson, began his transformation into Tom Thompson, the myth. Tom Thompson became almost the patron saint of the Group of Seven. He was never a member of the Group of Seven. The Group of Seven formed after his death. But he reflected the values of this core group of artists who, uh, in the 1920s, really wanted to define a national school of painting. And they really were one of Canada's most important groups of Canadian artists because they really were the first to seek an expression that was distinctly Canadian. I think it's also reflective of a, of a nation that wanted to define its place in the world and they needed a, a, an emblem, a cultural emblem, and these artists uh, provided that. And they are officially formed in 1920 with their first exhibition. And of course, they continue for 12 years with seven more exhibitions. The group of seven fluctuated a bit over the years, eventually becoming a group of 10 artists, although always retaining their original name. Other members would include A.J. Casson, Lionel Fitzgerald, and Edwin Holgate. Throughout the 1920s, the group of seven, um, their styles diverge, but they also develop individual approaches. And one of the wonderful ideals of the Group of Seven was that they saw themselves as a catalyst, as a catalyst for other artists and for Canadian art in general. Now, many of their paintings are here at the McMichael Canadian Art Collection. Robert and Signe McMichael built up their collection in a place that used to be their very own log cabin home, nestled in a hub of wilderness. So of course, um, although aesthetically a log and stone building is lovely, it becomes very difficult to maintain. While fresh air and natural light provide a wonderful ambiance for the gallery, it's a double-edged sword. It's a threat to the art. And was Tom Thompson's mysterious demise death by nature, or was he murdered? This is Woodland Waterfall, one of the last large paintings Tom Thompson did on canvas. He painted it over the winter of 1916 to 1917. This is his interpretation of a waterfall and river in Algonquin Park. Thompson and the men who went on to form the Group of Seven ventured out into that park many times. Together, they forever changed the landscape of Canadian art. What made them special was that they were looking for um, an expression that was apart from the old world or the European world, which was very much what everything looked like. And of course, Canada at that time, early in the 20th century, was very much an extension of Europe. So even artistically, artists would go abroad to study, to Paris, to London, to Germany, to Venice. Th their subject matter was European. Their techniques were European. So the idea that we would have a distinctive Canadian art that would be our subject matter, our techniques, was really very new. Because I know when we look at it today, it looks traditional, conventional, but it wasn't back then. And so, of course, what was the perfect vehicle for that? The northern wilderness and who was one of the great inspirational forces behind the Group of Seven? Tom Thompson. They created beautiful works of art inspired by the wilderness to capture what they saw as the spirit of Canada on canvas. This museum houses many great works by Tom Thompson and the Group of Seven, 
but in a way, it is also a threat to them. It's a problem because this place didn't start off as a museum. It started off as a home, the home of Robert and Sidney McMichael. They also love the wilderness. That's why they built their home here. That's also why they were so inspired to collect many of Tom Thompson and the Group of Seven's works. In doing so, they created a legacy out of their love for art that lives on today. The story really begins in 1952, when Robert and Sidney McMichael purchase 10 acres of land in Kleinberg, Ontario, and this was clear farmland. Well, by 1955, they have completed construction on their log and stone home. This was originally their home. And they then collect their very first work of Canadian art, which was a work by Lauren Harris entitled Montreal River Algoma, which they paid $250 for. The next painting they bought was Tom Thompson's sketch of Pine Island. Thompson painted it on an excursion to Georgian Bay in 1914. Robert McMichael had a clear vision for what he wanted in his and Signe's collection. I believe he said uh, an impressive condensation of the spirit of our nation's artistic heritage. And that vision it came very much from the work that so inspired him, of course, the work of the Group of Seven. Hundreds of people would file into the McMichael's own private gallery that just happened to also be their home. They continued to collect art, especially um, Tom Thompson, the Group of Seven, Inuit art, First Nations, so that by 1965, they now have collected 194 works um, by um, many of these Canadian artists. And of course, the home has also grown. It's now over 5,000 square feet. It started originally around 2,000 square feet. In 1965, realizing what a national treasure they had accumulated, the McMichaels donated their entire collection of 194 works, their land, and home to the province of Ontario. And this is really when um, the McMichael Canadian Art Collection becomes this public museum. Now, since that time, the collection has expanded significantly. We are privileged to be in this wonderful institution here today from what has grown essentially out of a private love between two individuals, Robert and Sigmund Michael, into a vast collection of over 5,000 uh, individual artworks consisting of sculpture, painting, prints, drawings. It's a lot more than an art gallery. It, it really is a park, a museum, an art gallery, and a cemetery. It is, I think, in a sense, a complete Canadian experience. Six of the ten Group of Seven members are buried here. Arthur Lismer, Frank Johnson, A.J. Casson, Lauren Harris, A.Y. Jackson, and Frederick Varley. Robert McMichael is also buried here. But Tom Thompson, who died mysteriously at Canoe Lake, is not. And it was strange and mysterious because he was an expert canoeist, an expert fisherman, and he knew Algonquin Park very well. In fact, he was a paid guide and worked there for long periods um, throughout the year. He was buried immediately at Algonquin Park, and supposedly his body was disinterred and moved to his hometown at Leith, and that's where it rests today. But his studio, once in downtown Toronto, now sits on the grounds next to the gallery that houses many of his works. If you come to the McMichael Canadian Art Collection, you can see the very room in which Tom Thompson painted and the landscape from which he drew his inspiration. I think when you walk in that shack, it's a, it's a fairly powerful feeling that you get the sense of the man and the scale. There are living quarters and studio quarters, and I think that there's some really powerful magic in that house. Incredible works of art were created in this very studio. This is where Thompson would take his sketches, his impressions of the wilderness up north, and turn them into larger feats of art. They're approximately eight by 10 inches, and they're really documents of his experience in Algonquin Park. 
So what you see there are his immediate responses to the environment around him. And he was um, incredibly good at documenting the changing moods of the weather, the changing light, the changing seasons. Tom Thompson's waterfall is a good example of these larger canvases that he would have worked up in the studio. And it's there that we see, instead of these immediate sketches that, that were treated to in the smaller little um, canvases, here we now see uh, a large work with that strong sense of design and composition. Tom Thompson had the natural talent of a great artist. Combine that with the mystery surrounding his death. He was a man destined to lead himself and the group of seven into the realm of mythology. Well, the McMichael Canadian Art Collection really builds upon this mythology. It, it's a direct result of this mythology. Robert and Signe McMichael were so um, attracted and fell so deeply in love with the paintings of Tom Thompson and the group of seven that they built this. Uh, museum here in the woods, in the wilderness, uh, so that you can have the experience not only of the paintings here, but you can look out the windows or walk the grounds and see the wilderness or a simulation of the wilderness that so attracted the group of seven. The museum now stands on 100 acres of conservation land with a network of paths and trails winding through its natural oasis. The outside grounds would seem the perfect complement to the artistic expression of the wilderness on the walls inside this museum. Of course, um, from a museological perspective, um, a domestic building, or what was originally a domestic building, presents all kinds of challenges for a museum where it's important to us, as part of preserving the collection, to maintain consistent temperatures and humidity. The logs like the opposite of what the art likes, so it's always a struggle to, to maintain. The humidity fluctuates throughout the year. Um, it goes up in the summer, it goes down in the winter, and inside of a normal house, it would feel that fluctuation quite greatly. Um, and you also have a fluctuation in temperature. So uh, back, back in the day, they had fireplaces to control the heat. So you would uh, light a fire in the winter and uh, not light a fire in the summer, and that's about it. In today's day and age, that simply doesn't work for a museum. But for a long while, when Robert and Signe McMichael lived here, and for a while after they turned it over to the province of Ontario as a museum, it was like that. But there was no insulation between the logs, so that's that would be an infiltration through that space. Um, you'd get a lot of t a lot of fluctuation of temperature. You'd have a lot of cold weather coming through, hot temperatures, moisture. Nothing was sealed properly, so it was a very leaky building. Insulation value is the biggest thing. The log is fairly good insulation value. It's about uh, 12 inches thick, so you're not going to have a lot of temperature coming through there, or not at a very rapid pace anyway. Uh, but this was basically an air gap between the two. So you'd have a small bit of uh, cement on the outside, a small bit of cement on the inside, and then cold air between or hot air between. And that's how the infiltration came through. And if you can imagine uh, a room, this room itself is probably 80 feet long, uh, and you've got a wall about 10 feet high. So if you look at a four inch gap every, every 10 or 12 inches, it's a lot of air coming in. But what does that mean for the art? I'm going to give you an example of your wooden door at your house. When it's the summer, your wooden door is quite difficult to get open because the wood swells. And in the, it, with that humidity rise, your, the wood expands a bit. Whereas in the winter, it's quite easy to get your door open because the wood contracts. And you can uh, put that into terms with paintings. Paintings are sometimes painted on wood and that, that wooden panel is going to expand and contract with those fluctuations in humidity. So what you would be looking at basically is um, during a given year, those paintings would expand for half of the year, contract for the other half, and it's going yearly, on a yearly basis, expanding and contracting. And so you can imagine it takes its toll on the actual paint. That causes flaking, it causes cracking. Fluctuating humidity is a huge problem that's only exacerbated in the summertime by the hot temperatures. Warmer air is more capable of holding a greater amount of water than colder air is. If you think of the winter time, you go over to your window, quite often you'll see condensation on it um, because the, the air cannot hold that humidity, so it, it kind of condenses onto the, uh, the window instead of 
being suspended. So you will, you have a greater capability in the summer of holding a greater capacity of water within a, a given area of air. Winters aren't any better either. Anybody around this area will know in the winter you'll have a very dry, dry temperature in, in the spaces. In the summer, of course, lots of moisture, um, but the, the fluctuation was quite, quite a bit. If you think of it in terms of yourself, in the winter your skin becomes quite dry and it'll flake quite easily, it'll get cracked quite easily. I would, I would say that it's the same for a painting. Um, if it's a dry, dry air, your paint layers will become more brittle and it's also the same if it's a very cold air, your paintings are going to be quite brittle. So it just means that they're a lot more fragile at that state. If they are shaken or bumped or anything like that, you could get a, a greater damage than you would normally get. The natural environmental threats were only part of the problem that came with the house. There used to be a swimming pool right here underneath this theater. And then there was the lobby. We used to have a fountain in the lobby as well, which was, uh, you see the center pillar in, the, in our lobby. Uh, the pillar's still there and the working parts are still there, but we used to have a knee wall around the outside and that used to be a fountain. That would wreak havoc on, on the humidity, of course, because of mist and water running. Humidity and the lack thereof was a problem, but so were the windows. And of course, it's important and our visitors appreciate the wonderful expansive windows for the original parts of the home that Mr. and Mrs. McMichael had built. However, of course, all of that light um, the UV uh, rays create incredible damage, especially for paperworks. After the break, while it's too late to save Tom Thompson, it's not too late to save his art. Montreal River by Lauren Harris was Robert and Sidney McMichael's first group of seven painting. Next, they bought Tom Thompson's Pine Island sketch. Back in the first quarter of the 20th century, these artists carved out a place for themselves in Canada's cultural landscape. It was partly born out of a desire to assert themselves and their country on an international stage during and after World War I. So they were part of a vanguard of artists, as there likely were vanguards in other areas of uh, society that wanted to recreate society, wanted to recreate the world, wanted to recreate relationships between nations, wanted to recreate relationships between spiritual things and earthly things. And these artists came together as a group to look at what can be found in the North, what can be found in Canada's Rockies, what can be found in the Arctic, what can be found in Algonquin Park and around the Northern Lake Superior. Their style was a new type of art, one distinctly Canadian, one greatly inspired by Tom Thompson. His mysterious death in 1917 added to the legend that sprouted up around him and his art. Well, Tom Thompson is really larger than life. He, in his death, ironically, he's become this living phenomenon. He represents a great deal to a lot of people. He's the iconic artist, he's the romantic artist who went into the wilderness and painted these fabulous paintings that still have a great deal of meaning today. But he's also an artist who uh, was a loner. He was uh, of an age when a lot of his peer group were being sent to war and they were dying. He was an outdoorsman, he was a fisherman, he was, he, he, he was a woodsman. So he was a very complex person. One can get a sense of this walking through Thompson's exhibit here at the McMichael Canadian Art Collection. This is where many of Tom Thompson's works are today, hanging in a museum that was once a log cabin home. It's an appropriate place to experience Canada's wilderness, inside and outside the galleries. But is this place, with all the pitfalls of a leaky log cabin home, an appropriate place for the art? Light, humidity, and fluctuating temperatures can make the art vulnerable to irreparable damage. Changes were made, but how do you take a rare log cabin and make it non-hazardous to the art? There have been improvements with the roof, with the walls, with everything that we've done here to improve this building so that it controls it uh, to the optimum temperature and humidity that uh, we, can, we can meet so that we can get all of our low materials in here and, and maintain our, our collection as best we can. 
They also wanted to maintain the feel of a log cabin home, since it's such a great fit for this environment and the art inside. The inside, uh, we didn't change anything to keep it as authentic as possible. It's still a beautiful look. On the inside, we don't have to worry about temperatures, but on the outside, we extracted all the original chinking, uh, plaster and lath, um, put in some more blocking so we wouldn't have any more sagging with the logs because they're long spans, uh, insulated uh, the cavity, and then put a product called Permachink over top with a small layer of insulation on that as well. Not as durable, doesn't last as long, but um, it, it's, it's a lot better for the environment uh, as far as uh, the building environment and building envelope and gives us more protection, uh, which we can, we can replace easily. Uh, the, per, the, the original chinking is very costly and expensive and uh, labor intensive to remove and, and to install. They replace the old chinking everywhere it counts. Take this hallway. The outside wall is fairly new and is properly insulated, whereas the inside wall isn't, to retain as much of the old building as possible while still protecting the art. For the windows, they used a combination of solutions to protect the art inside from UV damage. On the original windows, they put a film on the inside to, just to protect from, from UV. So we've got beautiful windows, beautiful views, and we, we've had to cover up some windows completely, and some other ones we, we have blinds on. We can still get the, the gist of what's happening outside, but you don't get the, the, the full view, which would be nice. But again, it's the protection of the art and, and trying to make it last as long as we possibly can so many generations can enjoy it. So you'll often see the windows, and many of them screened as lightly as we can to ensure that the works are protected. And of course, we've had to also create and build barriers, um, humidity barriers, to again keep the environment stable. These solutions to the UV problem are on the leading edge for now. The original windows that were open crank out windows on the on the bottom. So. Uh, like anything else, over over time, 30 years, uh, they, the wood windows at that time were, were great windows. But now there's been some improvements with argon gases and, and the, the films on the inside of the, uh, the glazing to protect uh, with the UV rays. So every improvement, of course, uh, technology goes on. I'm sure 20 years from now or, or so, we're going to be saying these ones aren't uh, as great as they could be as well. But uh, for this day and time, it's uh, a fantastic technology, and we're going to try to capitalize on it as best we can. If the museum wants to continue getting world-class exhibits on loan, it's imperative they maintain high standards for every gallery in this museum. If you had a, a valuable piece of art coming and loaning it for, for a show, you want to make sure that uh, people are going to maintain it um, as best they possibly can. That's why they constantly monitor the air temperature and humidity inside each gallery. We have hydrothermographs in the spaces, as well as all of our vaults, art vaults have hydrothermographs. That's considered, I guess, um, guaranteed, but older technology. We're, we're putting a new uh, building automation system in, which is uh, encompassing with our, our security system, as well as our, our um, building automation system, which maintains and makes sure that we're, we're keeping track of, which also has sensors in every space for humidity control, temperature control, uh, safeties, and everything else in these, in these spaces. Um, and we can, we can graph and we can record uh, up to a year um, the record exactly what we're, our percentages are as far as humidity. Many things need to be taken into consideration when attempting to maintain a museum of this caliber. Considering the size of this building being log and stone out in the middle of the woods, it's kind of a rare building. And uh, we don't like to say challenges, but every time you check one thing out and, and solve one problem, sometimes you open up other problems. So once we sealed up uh, the building nice and tight to protect the art, and the air quality wasn't good, so we had to put in some more mechanical uh, units to bring in uh, fresh air to make sure that we were up to regulation. So it's, it's an ongoing um, challenge, but it's a, a lot better now that the building is uh, up to par as far as the art goes. The art inside is now safe from environmental degradation. Despite its rustic appearances, the McMichael Canadian Art Collection today is state of the art. It's also one of a kind. What started as one couple's personal art collection in their home grew into an incredible museum housing thousands of works of art. This gallery is unique. I mean, we are a log cabin in the middle of suburbia, which has just grown and grown and just expanded out. And it's a weird sort of pattern. And from my understanding, it was because Robert McMichael did not want to chop any trees down as he expanded out. 
Its unique structure works well with the landscape, but it provides certain obstacles for the curators. And it, it's a residential building, essentially, so our ceilings are lower um, and they're long hallways, so there's a number of challenges when hanging shows. Um, we work with that in, in, in our environment, and so we know to make a show good, to make the work look good, there are certain key walls and vantage points that works need to be placed on so that it catches your eyes, so that when you stand at an entranceway, you're hit with boom, 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 boom. To make this the spectacular exhibit that it is, the only way they could do it is to work with the building whenever possible. You know, I don't know of any other gallery that has log walls that they hang on. But to me, that really provides such excellent ambiance, and you get such a feeling, if it's done right, of this space. And it works particularly well in the Northwest Coast area, where it's like you're in a different era, you're in a different time frame, a different space. And that's how architecture and lighting and that can really move you to these different regions. But it is a constant challenge to, to, deal, to deal with these spaces, and uh, I think we've come up with some good compromises. In many places, they had no choice but to cover up the original insides with newer walls. Many of these works of art are part of their core exhibit, the stuff people expect to see when they come to the McMichael Canadian Art Collection. Then there are the special exhibits, on loan to the museum from other places. Every year, the museum's inventory grows as they acquire new works of art for their collection. Unfortunately, there's only so much wall space. Many of them end up in rotation, from the vaults to the galleries and back again. Art continuously moves in and through this museum. Not all of it arrives in pristine condition. When we return, the challenges of saving art from deterioration and Tom Thompson's mysterious death, will it ever be solved? James Wilson Maurice painted sailing boats more than 100 years ago. He was a Canadian contemporary of Tom Thompson and the Group of Seven. When the McMichael Canadian Art Collection acquired this painting in 2005, it was in terrible condition. Somehow, the canvas became stretched over the wooden frame underneath it. And this entire thing was warped, it kind of twisted. And the frame that was around the painting, the decorative frame, was also warped and twisted. The actual paint itself was also in trouble. It had been previously restored, um, and they had used a lot of strong solvents and a lot of heat, which caused the actual paint layer to wrinkle, which is something that we can't correct. But we fixed the frame, we gave it a new stretcher underneath the actual canvas itself to make it be in plane um, so it's not twisted anymore. You would have to look microscopically at it to see that work has been done. The actual painting itself does have um, cracking that is visible to the naked eye. Um, you will see a lot of old works that have the same cracking. It's just mechanical cracking. It's, it occurs um, over time, so that's something that cannot be fixed, but it, it looks quite nice now. That's just one example of the kind of work that needs to be done with paintings the museum acquires. What are the secrets behind salvaging art from deterioration? Many of the works that come in are from private collections. These usually need a little retouching and cleaning before they're ready to be hung. But you have electrostatic charges that are going on no matter what surface you're talking about and the dust is attracted to it. So you have a painting that's been on the wall for let's say 30 or 40 years. It has 30 or 40 years worth of dust on it as well, and if this painting is hung in the vicinity of a fireplace, you have soot that's on there. If it's hung in a house where there are smokers, you have nicotine that collects on the surface. And all of this can be cleaned off if it's um, compatible with the paint layer, if it's okay. But before Catherine attempts anything, she first needs to test the painting to see what she can do to fix it. There are many things that we can use to clean um, dust and debris off and um, not everything is compatible. You learn in chemistry that like dissolves like. If you think about clothing, grease stains, you can't use some detergents, and blood stains, you can't use some detergents. It's the same with paintings. In this case, she's using a rather abundant solution to clean this A.J. Casson Group of Seven painting. The solvent or solution that we use the most frequently is saliva. 
Um, it is our own saliva. We actually take it directly from our mouth. You don't spit into a little glass or anything. Um, but it's a mild enzymatic solution, so it works to break up the dirt and to lift it from the painting. And it's very, very stable, very nice, and you rinse it off um, afterwards with distilled water. You just do a quick swipe on your tongue. And then I just gently rolling it across the surface to pick up the very surface of the, uh, the dirt. This one is very cracked underneath. Um, it has micro cracking going on that you can only essentially see with the microscope. And um, you don't want the moisture to affect that and to make the cracks spread. So in order to do that and to make sure that you're being very gentle in getting all of the dirt and use a microscope. Just a little bit of cleaning makes a big difference. You can see that I'm getting, you know, well, it doesn't look like a significant amount, but for this tiny area, oh, it's up against white, so it's just the very tip. Every piece of work that comes in from private collections must be examined individually. At any one time, what you see out in the galleries is just a tiny proportion of what's actually here. Most of the paintings are stored on site, as well as the works on paper and artifacts. We have three different vaults. The vaults are key card access only. The paintings are currently stored, it's basically a, a, a storage rack, and they're stored side by side. We have racks, which the objects are stored on as well. Um, we also have a paper vault, which you use solander boxes, and the papers are stacked. Oh, this is a great one. They're uh, about to head off into the wilderness to go sketching. Like this Lismer sketch, every piece inside this vault is another part of Canada's history. This is one of Tom Thompson's palettes. And it's a nice little home. You can just sort of imagine him out there. Of course, these are all the colors that you see in his works. Items like these, Tom Thompson's color palette, his axe, they all add up to a story that adds layer upon layer of insight into the man behind these famed works of art. Tom Thompson is as alive today as an artist as he was in 1917. His work still has a great deal of appeal to, to people here at the McMichael Canadian Art Collection. That's one of our more popular galleries. People come to see the Tom Thompsons. And I can't blame them because I go down there every day and take a look at them too. They're really beautiful works of art. Collectors uh, are collecting his work and they're starting to fetch some rather high prices. So on a number of different levels, he is maybe more popular today than he was even at the time of his death. His popularity helped to propel the Group of Seven status as Canada's preeminent painters forward. And they needed a romantic uh, presence, that romantic hero, that great artist that everyone recognized. The group recognized that Thompson was privileged. He was blessed with talent that was, was intuitive, that was God-given, that was uh, more experiential than uh, technical whereas they saw themselves as uh, in his shadow. And that dichotomy was quite mythic. It played to this, this, this mythology that, was, that grew up in the, in the 20s and 30s around the Group of Seven. It's been said that if Tom Thompson hadn't have happened, the nation would have had to have invented him uh, in order to help it grow as a nation and define itself as a nation. And in some ways, the Thompson that came after is an invented Thompson, it's a romantic Thompson. It is this great Promethean figure that exists outside of time and space that symbolizes a moment in a nation's life or uh, the spirit of a nation. But what really happened to Tom Thompson back in 1917 at Canoe Lake? First his canoe was found, then his body. What happened? Well. I think the only thing we know for sure is that he fell over, there was a bruise on his right temple, and that there was some blood in his ear. So there's obviously some trauma to the head, and that the cause of death, the, the pathologist or the coroner at the time, put it down as drowning. But did he drown in this lake, or was he murdered? 
Or maybe he just slipped and fell on the rocks as he was taking his canoe into shore. It's still one big mystery, but the seed was planted for the legend of Tom Thompson to grow to mythic proportions. After that, the group of seven continued on in Tom Thompson's tradition and legacy, producing more art inspired by the landscapes they loved so much. Their notoriety and fame grew over the years as Canadians embraced their ideology and style of depicting the vast wilderness of the nation's landscape. The mystery of Tom Thompson took another turn in 1956, when a group of four men out on a sketching trip to Canoe Lake discovered a body they thought might be Tom Thompson's. Many of the lake locals never really believed Thompson's body was moved to Leith. The legend sprouted. Convinced that Thompson's death was the result of foul play, and knowing that some people claimed his body was never really moved in 1917, the four men decided to dig up the past themselves. The bones weren't Tom Thompson's. Instead, they belonged to a younger Native American man. But in excavating the past, they also dug up even more mystery that compounded the growing mythology surrounding Tom Thompson's life and death. There are unofficial stories and official stories about where the body is. Officially, the body is in the family grave at Leith, in the little churchyard there. Unofficially, though, it may still be either near Canoe Lake, overlooking Canoe Lake, or it may be in the nearby area of Canoe Lake. It may be under a cairn, it may be under some rocks, it may be somewhere else. Thompson's brother and the undertaker who officially moved the body say they moved Tom Thompson to Leith, over the years, many people have called to dig up the body in Leith to do a forensic examination. Thompson's family refuses. The mystery surrounding his final whereabouts and death continue. Since his death, a lot of legend, a lot of mythology, a lot of romance has been attracted to this figure to the extent that his death wasn't just particular, but it was a mythic event. It was a mythic event in the development of Canadian art and perhaps in the birth of this nation. Some would say that he was murdered. Some would say that it was a suicide. Some would say that there was a blow to the head as a result of, of a fight. Some might say that he was killed in a cabin, a drunken brawl over some debt, and he fell and hit his head on the grill work, and that in panic, his assailant took him and put him in the lake and tied a rock around his leg and went down. Some would say that he made a deal with the devil five years earlier, and the devil came and got him. Like any mystery that keeps growing, there are questions abound, but not many answers. But what we know for sure is that a great artist's life was cut off, and I think when A.Y. Jackson heard, he, he summarized it best, was that they recognized that this was a great creative talent, this was a great human being and a great fellow, a vivacious man, a lively man, a complex man, who was privileged, he was inordinately talented, gifted, uh, whereas they had to work hard. He had the touch of the angels, and perhaps the angels came and took him away. When you read the language of the time in the newspapers, there, that mythology was already, even in his death notice, was starting to emerge. The language was romantic. His own true love, his own true muse took him home. And that stuck, and in fact, later on, that became kind of the clarion call of the, of the group of seven. They used that mythology to create this national school. So what came first, the death or the mythology? Or did the myth make the death more than it really was? I think it's, it's really all an open question, but what we know is that it was emblematic of the time. Remember, the war is occurring, men are dying in, in battle, and this was one more death. This was a senseless, needless death because even while all of this carnage is occurring in the world, here is a man in literally in heaven, wilderness heaven, and he, even he is taken. And perhaps that was the one straw too many. And I think that's the abiding mythology that's the tragedy of that melancholy moment that it was, it can't be understood. It can only be mythologized. It can only be expressed in terms of poetry and myth. With all the speculation that's taken place over the years, 
It's curious to ponder what Thompson himself would have thought of the seemingly endless questions surrounding his death. Well, he probably would have thought it was Balderdash. He, uh, he, I don't think he was a pretentious man. I think he was a very uh, pragmatic man, uh, a staunch Presbyterian. He was, um, he probably didn't hold a lot of truck with uh, uh, that kind of romantic mythologizing. Um, he would have thought it was, would have been curious, I think, but he, uh, he strikes me as more practical. He was wanting, he, he, he wanted direct experience. He didn't want a romantic experience. And you can see that in his paintings. It's really, you know, he wants to capture the essence of walking through this landscape. That rings true for most people as they walk through his exhibit here at the McMichael Canadian Art Collection. For Canadians, when they stand in front of his paintings, there is a deep connection that is so ephemeral it can, it can barely be defined. And what is that? I don't know what it is. I feel it. Uh, but isn't that, isn't that interesting that that power, that zap, should still be present today? The power, mythology, and intrigue that have built up around Tom Thompson and the Group of Seven bring more and more people to this museum every year. In the future, the McMichael Canadian Art Collection will A, be exploring more deeply this phenomenon of the Group of Seven and this mythology that's uh, grown up around them and try to understand it as, as fully as we possibly can. And secondarily, to expand that, to, to look at other traditions, analogous traditions in the Canadian uh, artistic experience, say, artists of the, of the North, the Inuit artists, the artists, say, of the West, um, and in some way to, to draw in contemporary artists who might be feeding on or building from that tradition. The artists who were the foundation of that tradition were in their prime at a time that was ripe for a mythology to grow. Canada was a young country finding its way on the international stage during World War I. These artists played their part in carving out their national cultural identity. It was the perfect time for one man to come forward to stake out that claim for all future artists to follow. That person was Tom Thompson, the man, the mystery, the myth. How will this mystery play out in the future? Well, I think it's not going to go away. People are always intrigued by a good mystery. Why should this one become more than just a particular event to touch us so, so deeply as a nation? I think that that mystery will probably provide a great deal of inspiration for a more meaningful and deeper probe that's not simply stylistic or art historical, but more holistic, uh, the life and the times of an artist who lived and worked as a woodsman, as an artist, as a guide, and a great uh, brother to a large family.